So today we're diving into one of my favorite supplements and its supposed role in cancer. Now, you know I'm an advocate for a custom supplement plan that is driven by biomarkers and genetics when possible. A lot of times we use supplements to support testosterone and bone building androgens, but there's concern by some in the longevity space that some of these supplements will actually cause cancer. And obviously that would be a big problem if that were true. So stick with me while we explore if this common bone building supplement could actually cause cancer according to the literature. So what is this supplement that we're talking about? I'm talking about DHEA. Now you may have already heard of this, but what is DHEA? Well, DHEA actually stands for dehydroepiandrosterone. And I'm not gonna say that again. We'll just call it DHEA. It is a steroid hormone that is produced primarily by the adrenal glands. And it plays a critical role as a precursor in testosterone, as well as some other things. We have seen a transition to using DHEA for androgen support in our practice rather than testosterone itself, because we have seen that in women that are over 60 years of age, on average, it's hard to get adequate levels of testosterone without running into side effects. So estradiol is usually more relevant for bone loss. And when we can use estradiol, we want to do that and then add testosterone if still needed. But what we're finding is that we don't necessarily need to replace testosterone out of the gate. And oftentimes women, even postmenopausal women, if they have optimized estradiol and progesterone levels, actually can get by and have optimized testosterone levels with just DHEA or sometimes with nothing at all. So I've previously reviewed studies showing that DHEA can actually increase testosterone, IGF-1, and even bone mineral density as an independent intervention. It's pretty powerful. However, some people have concerns about DHEA. Some people say that it could be causing an increase in the risk of developing cancer. So it brings up some great questions like, what if you have a strong family history of cancer? What if you're really scared of cancer? What if you've had cancer? Should you be taking DHEA? And the ugly truth is this, DHEA, either when supplemented or when naturally elevated, has been linked to an increased risk of certain types of cancers, particularly hormone-sensitive cancers like breast, prostate, and endometrial cancer. But remember, associations are not causations. And I always like to throw out these like fun examples of associations because sometimes people don't understand what this means. So if you don't understand the difference here, just stick with me. I got a couple of fun examples. So you see associations in literature, sometimes also said something is linked to something. But an association is not a causation, meaning that we did an intervention study, a randomized control trial, and we gave them this thing, and when we gave this other group placebo, and then in the group that had that thing, this thing happened, and in the placebo group, it didn't. Then it is more likely to be causative, right? Association says, I looked at a group of people, and this thing was consistent with this thing, but it doesn't mean that it caused it. So here's a fun couple of examples. So um, this is one that I learned when I was in medical school. So um, did you know that stork populations are associated with pregnancy rates? That's kind of cool, right? So in the mid 20th century, the stork population in Europe actually declined. And at the same time, so did birth rates. And now we all know that storks deliver babies, right? So it would then make sense that as the population of storks declined, so then did the pregnancies and the number of babies. Now, that is kind of a logical association, but it's obviously not correct. I think by now all of us on this channel know where babies come from. They both declined due to urbanization, deforestation, social expectations, etc. They both declined, but because of different reasons, they just happened to both decline simultaneously. They were not actually related. So while there is an association, certainly it is not causative. So I can think of a lot of good examples. Um, and so while that's kind of a fun one to talk about, another one would be meat and cancer, right? We hear this all the time. Red meat causes cancer. Well, there are plenty of studies that look at populations that eat red meat, that also have other bad habits, that have a higher risk of developing cancer. But if you look at any intervention that can separate out those details, you can see that red meat is not associated with cancer. So while there is an association of red meat eaters with an increased risk of cancer, there are so many variables in there and then people try to blame it on the red meat, but it is not causative. It is associated and it is associated with other habits like smoking, uh, highly processed food, environmental toxins, all of the other things that we know also cause cancer. So it's not the red meat, 
it's the associations of the other things that are in that group that are likely causative of cancer, although cancer is kind of a tough one to actually show. So the challenge here then is does DHEA just have an association with cancer or could it actually potentially be causative of cancer? There's some good studies to go through here. Let's take a look at what the literature shows. All right, so study number one is titled The Association of Plasma DHEA and DHEA Sulfate with Breast Cancer Risk in Premenopausal Women. So this is a 2006 prospective cohort study that investigates the relationship between plasma levels of DHEA and DHEAS, which is what you should really be measuring where you're looking for DHEA, and breast cancer risk in predominantly premenopausal women, and they use data from the Nurses Health Study 2 cohort. And here's the key findings. So while there was no significant association with DHEA and overall breast cancer diagnosis, there was a positive association with DHEA and estrogen and progesterone positive breast cancers. Uh-oh. So what does that mean? Well, we need to look at the statistics here, and then obviously we need to look at more than one study. So when you look at a study like this, they can demonstrate a relative risk. That means a relative risk of, of developing the thing that you're worried about, in this case, cancer. The relative risk for DHEA was 1.6 and for DHEA sulfate was 1.9. So what that means is that there was either a 60% or 90% increase in the relative risk of developing cancer, specifically estrogen and progesterone sensitive cancers. That sounds like a lot, right? Now, a couple other things about this. There was a notable interaction by age where women under 45, it actually looked protective, but women over 45, it actually looked like it was maybe more related, like a stronger association. So that's a problem for me because most of my patients are over 45 and we're using DHEA. So let's talk about these numbers then. So when we talk about a, a hazard ratio of 1.6 and 1.9, it does demonstrate that there is a 60 and 90% increased risk of developing the disease in question. But remember that when we're looking at studies like this, these are actually not big numbers. And if you think about like other things that have been associated with diseases like smoking and lung cancer, those hazard ratios were actually more like 20 to 30, meaning a 2000 to 3000 percent increase in uh, the actual diagnosis. So while it's concerning that this exists. It is not a strong enough association for us to just throw it out and say, oh my gosh, this is uh, too dangerous, we can't do it. We need further evaluation. We need more than one study. So this next study is called The Functions of Dihydroepiandrosterone in Relation to Breast Cancer. It is a 2022 case control study looking at DHEA levels in nipple aspirate fluid. Now. I don't know who signed up for this study, but they're actually looking at an, an aspirate of fluid from the nipple and the DHEA in the, the tissue, in the cells of the breast. So, okay, it's different than looking at it in blood, right? But let's see what it showed. It showed that DHEA levels in the fluid were significantly higher in those that have breast cancer, particularly in estrogen receptor positive tumors. Now, they did actually also measure blood levels or serum levels of DHEA, and there was no increased risk of cancer uh, based on levels, so the, the, those levels did not correlate. Their summary was that DHEA may promote cancer progression through IGF-1, which we know it raises. It also causes glucocorticoid suppression, so that's steroid suppression, which is in general a good thing. But then they also go on to say that DHEA also shows anti-tumor effects by boosting immunity and reducing inflammation. So it's kind of like a dual role. And according to these authors, that's quite perplexing. And I agree. So before we get through the rest of this and we come up with an answer as to whether or not we should be using DHEA in our population of bone health patients, let me tell you about our masterclass. If you have not attended our masterclass and you're wondering how the heck am I going to put all these things together that Dr. Doug is talking about, come to our free masterclass. This is why we created the masterclass. You'll hear me walk through some of the common myths, some of the common misconceptions in the bone health space and how we build out a program that is custom for each of our patients. It can be really, really helpful. We've had thousands of people go through this and we have gotten really great feedback. So if you haven't done that, please do that. Link for that is in the description below or you can go to our website, optimalhumanhealth.com. All right, so the next study, dihydroepiandrosterone, that's DHEA, cancer and aging. So this is a 2022 review article on the DHEA role in specifically cancer and preventing age-related diseases, emphasizing really the biochemical mechanism. So this is getting like deep in the science, okay? So what they say here is that DHEA inhibits oxidative stress, which is really good, we like that. 
and it's a crucial factor in cancer prevention. Well, that sounds different, right? They say that trials with low DHEA doses, now they're probably talking about men here because they say 50 to 100 milligrams, which is not a particularly low dose. But they say that these low doses show limited benefits and that you might want to consider higher doses. They end by saying that DHEA holds promise in cancer prevention, but its clinical efficacy may depend on using more potent analogs and alternative administration techniques. So they're talking about, are you going to inject it? Are you going to use sub-Q? Or do you need really high doses of DHEA to actually prevent cancer, use it as a cancer prevention tool? So I think what this is showing is this um, and the other study that showed that it might be protective, it's really confusing because DHEA should be protective of cancer. And yet we see these potential associations in, in an increase in risk of diagnosis. So let's keep going. So study number four is entitled DHEA's role in inhibiting metastatic processes in breast cancer cell lines. So it looks like DHEA significantly inhibits cell migration and invasion in some cell lines. So what does that mean? It means that in certain tumors, certain cancers, DHEA is going to actually stop the migration of the cells. It's the spreading of the cancer. And invasion is how it gets into like the blood vessels, for example, and how it becomes metastatic. So DHEA could actually be protective of cancer. And this is kind of interesting when you go back and think about that nipple aspirate study where they're actually looking at people that have breast cancer had higher levels of DHEA. I wonder if the body is actually making DHEA to help protect it from the cancer. Kind of an interesting thought, right? So they also found in the study that it reduced secretion of a lot of inflammatory molecules like interleukins, TNF alpha. We know that those things are linked to tumor growth. So they finished by saying that DHEA carries the potential to disrupt metastatic pathways in specific breast cancer cells. And they conclude that DHEA shows promise in inhibiting breast cancer, particularly in less invasive cell lines. They also suggest that it could actually be used as a treatment in early stage breast cancer. So this study is really showing that not only is it protective, but it's actually protective of somebody who already has cancer, even saying, oh my gosh, maybe we could use this as a treatment in breast cancer. That's pretty different than saying it causes breast cancer, right? So how do we make sense of this? Well, we know that DHA's role in cancer is multifaceted. It's acting both as a protective agent and potentially even a risk factor, but it really depends on the biological context. The overarching theory around breast cancer is that DHEA can increase levels of estradiol, E2. It can increase levels of testosterone, and those are true. As a result of the estradiol and testosterone increase, it could potentially promote cancers that are sensitive to these hormones. But wait, you've heard me talk about in the past that estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer. And you've also heard me probably talk about that testosterone is protective of breast cancer and prostate cancer for that matter. So why would DHEA then be causative? Well, I think the answer is that it's not. I think what we're seeing here is that the fear of hormones results in a fear of anything that increases hormones. Please remember that we need hormones. We thrive with optimized hormones. Does that mean that there's no risk? No, of course not. Nothing is for free. So I have two thoughts here. Number one is that perhaps DHEA is present because the body is reacting to cancer, like I just said. Remember, our bodies are smarter than we are. What if our bodies are making DHEA because we have cancer, not because we developed cancer? We have high levels of DHEA because the body is reacting to the thing that it's going through. It's not causative, it's associated in a positive way. So you can actually draw a parallel between this thought around DHEA increasing estrogen, increasing cancer to just the statement that in some studies, estradiol, HRT, estradiol alone, is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer diagnosis. It's true, we see this in some studies, but we see it in studies that have a clear end point and a clear beginning point, and we have a time frame in between in which we're doing the study. And so if you look at some of these studies where you are taking it for let's say five years and compare it to placebo, you might find an increase, especially in unopposed estrogen, because these cancers could potentially grow faster. That means they're gonna be diagnosed faster. So now you could make the same argument with DHEA. It's not that they cause cancer, it might make them grow faster, but that's gonna help them to be diagnosed faster, diagnosed earlier. And what we know is that the earlier a cancer is diagnosed, the better the outcomes are likely to be. And that's why we see, I think partially at least, that when women are on estradiol, when they develop breast cancer, breast cancers are more survivable. So what does that mean for those that are at high risk of cancer? And this is 
pretty controversial because this gets into the same conversation as we see with estrogen, as we see with testosterone in women that have, say, like a family history, for example. But just like I would say for those women that they already have an increased risk, but adding a hormone that isn't causative or doesn't actually associate with an increased risk of developing the disease doesn't actually change your risk. You still have increased risk, but this doesn't make it any worse. What about a woman who's had breast cancer? Can she go on DHEA? Well, this is more debatable. This is where we have to engage with oncology or get a third-party recommendation based off of the stage grade of the tumor. It is debatable, probably not a risk factor in my opinion, um, but I'm not going to start a woman on it without going down some kind of additional pathway, talking with oncology uh, or bringing in another oncologist who is more supportive of hormones. So then what do we do? Well, we still like DHEA as a starting point for androgens until we know that estrogen and progesterone are stable and optimized, and then we'll switch to testosterone if we need to. And again, what we're finding is we generally don't need to. If there is a cancer concern, we'll discuss it and we'll learn as much as we can about those fears, about those concerns, about those family history, personal history, et cetera. But here's the deal. You don't have to use androgens. We have plenty of women who are not on testosterone, not on DHEA, and they're seeing improvements in bone. I think it's a great tool. I think androgens are helpful. It's going to help you with muscle mass and potentially a lot of other things, but it is not required. All right, so that's it. If you like this video, consider our top three foods for osteoporosis or three things to do immediately after a diagnosis of osteoporosis. And remember, a diagnosis of osteoporosis is not the end, but deciding to reverse it is the beginning. I'll see you in the next video.